everybody. We're excited to see you today, no matter what time zone you're in. We're excited to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of LGBTQ Religious Archives Network and acknowledging 20 years of clearing our roots, the theme of our month long celebration. Some of you may have attended our launch party on Sunday and we wanna thank you for doing that. Thank you for joining us today for the first of five intergenerational conversations with some of the pioneers who challenged religious organizations to fully accept LGBTQ people. I am Marnie Warner and a member of the Board of Directors. Today, we have the pleasure of honoring Janie Spar, who has worked and continuously works tirelessly and courageously on behalf of the inclusiveness of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, especially within the Presbyterian Church USA. Janie became the most visible advocate for full inclusion in LGBT people in the Presbyterian Church, basically because of the journey in her career. Janie was ordained in 1974 and was an assistant pastor for four years before becoming the executive director of the Oakland Council of Presbyterian Churches. While in that position, she was encouraged to resign just for being a lesbian. Janie went on to found the Spectrum Center for LGBTQ Concerns and was executive director there for 10 years. The Spectrum Center and the Marin AIDS Project were combined five years ago and is now named the SPAR Center. What an honor for Janie and what a tribute to her abilities. In 1991, Janie was called to become the pastor of the Downtown United Presbyterian Church in Rochester, New York. Unfortunately, other Presbyterian churches objected to that call because again, Janie was a lesbian. After several appeals, uh, it turned out that the call was rescinded. But the Downtown United Presbyterian was very creative and invited Janie to become a traveling evangelist which is what she does for the next decade, advocating for LGBTQ folks throughout the nation in Presbyterian churches and especially candidates for ministry. As of today, of course, a conversation needs two people and Janie invited Ananda Barkley to be part of this conversation. Ananda is a, a chaplain fellow at Stanford University and a pastor of the Mission Bay Community Church in San Francisco. The program for the next hour will include Janie and Ananda engaging each other in conversation for about half an hour. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will have time for a few questions. Some of you may want to personally greet Janie and Ananda afterwards, so just stay on the webinar and you'll be put into a meeting room. But before we go right to Janie and Ananda, I want to introduce Rick Peterson, who's going to give a few words about the LGBT brand's 20th anniversary. Thank you. I apologize for my technical deficiencies. Um, again, I'm Rick Peterson. I'm treasurer of the LGBTQ Religious Archives Network Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us today. As the board was planning these 20th, this 20th anniversary set of events, we were clear that we wanted to remember our past in order to guide us into the future. As we celebrate all that LGBTQ ran and Janie Spar have accomplished over the last 20 years, we must also continue to provide a foundation and infrastructure to support the compilation and study of this rich religious history. We have set an audacious challenge goal for our 20th anniversary. We want to raise $20,000 to help us lay a firm foundation for our next 20 years. I am pleased to report that we are actually pretty well along our way in achieving this challenge goal. We had a remarkable launch party on Sunday, and as of last night, we have raised $11,130, over half of our goal. Actually, it's 55.6% of our goal. In addition, we have 
17 sponsors and five allies who are supporting Queering Our Roots with more joining daily. This is terrific. Now I'm inviting you all to join with these generous friends to help us moving forward with this bold and audacious $20,000 challenge goal. Giving is easy. There are several ways. You can type giveq.org on your phone or computer, wait a second, and you will be directed to the special Queering Our Roots campaign. It really works, I've tried it. You can use the QR code found on the screen. I suspect most of you know how to use QR codes, but for Luddites like me, this is how you do it. You open the camera app on your iPhone, point the iPhone at the QR code to scan it, and then tap the pop-up banner of the QR icon to open it. It should open easily. And a third way is simply to go to the LGBTQ RAN homepage and hit donate. It's one of the first things you'll find. In addition, we have been incredibly fortunate that an, that an anonymous donor has come forward to match any and all Queering Our Roots contributions up to $20,000. That's simply amazing. In addition, Ellie Charlton, another incredibly generous benefactor, has made a special contribution specifically to celebrate and to incentivize first-time donors to LGBTQ RAN. All first-time gifts to LGBT RAN will receive an additional match. That means that contributions from first-time donors will be tripled. Your gift of $25 will become $75 your contribution of $100 will become $300. I suspect that many of you know how remarkable it is just how much LGBTQ RAN accomplishes on its very small budget. The board and the incredible LGBTQ RAN staff are committed to ensuring that our collective religious legacies will be passed on to future generations. Would you please help us make this happen by giving as generous a gift as you can to LGBTQ RAN today? Thank you for your generous support. I remember learning about Janie in the early 2000s as churches that were already open to LGBTQ folks rallied around Janie when she was charged and went, underwent a formal trial for officiating at same-sex marriages in California. There was a short period of time when same-sex marriages were legal in 2008. However, the Presbyterian Church did not recognize or want anyone officiating at such ceremonies. In preparing for this webinar, I learned that Janie and Ananda have worked together in more like Presbyterian Church activities are involved in the trans heart line, which affirms gender transitions and have become friends along the way. As LGBTQ RAN is about recording history, I wanna share a story that Janie told me about Ananda's ordination examination. Janie has attended many ordination exams over the four decades of her ministry. In 2014, at Ananda's exam, it was the first time that no one asked the question about what it means to be a lesbian in ministry. The questions were focused on what was Ananda's call and what would her ministry be about. It has taken decades, truly decades, for us to get to this point to be recognized for just who we are in our ministries. So now I'm going to ask Ananda and Janie to begin their conversation. Thank you so much, Marnie. Hi, Janie. <laughs> Hi, Ananda. <laughs> so the first question I have for you is what inspired or compelled you to step into the path that you've taken? Well, first of all, thank you 
to you for being with me and for LGBTQ Rand, for the amazing ministry that you do to even remember some of us old dykes, some of us old folks that are here. So I wanted to say, I've always known from the time I was a little girl, I was like, I think 10 years old and my twin sister Joni and I went to this uh, church in which they were having, many of the Presbyterian churches came together once a year in which you heard a speaker and so on. And I heard this speaker and he was saying things like this. Notice I said, and he was saying things like this. He was saying, if I were younger, you know, I would help with the marginalized. I would do, and he started naming these litany of things. And I, I looked around and I felt like he was talking just to me. And mm -hmm. so I thought to myself, I can do this. I can do this. You bet. I could be a Presbyterian minister. I never saw a, a woman minister. I never, but I knew from the time I was 10 years old, this was it. And then at 14, at 18, whatever, every time when people say, what are you going to be? I was going to say, I'm going to be a Presbyterian minister. And so I was one of the first women in Pittsburgh Presbytery full-time. I linked myself with this amazing um, mentor and friend, Wanda Graham Harris, and I was ordained to this really intercultural ministry right there called the Hazelwood Presbyterian Ministry. And I remember the first time I preached and she said to me, ooh, child, what is that? And I, she said, you are talking from your head. She said, you got to talk from your heart. She said, I'm going to teach you how to preach from your neck down. So I tell everybody it's her fault that <laughs> this is how I preach. And then I went on. And of course, the great thing is I realized I was lesbian and then the church didn't want me. But, you know, you just keep going because once you're called, it's like, OK, well, then we'll just go on and start our own LGBT ministry. And so it's just been that way because I think once you hear that you're called, it's like, okay, okay, God, let's do this thing, whatever this is. And so it just kept happening all along, all along confirmed. So Ananda, you tell me, how did you get into this business? How did you get, how was your call affirmed? How did you know? Well, thank you, Janie. And also thank you to you and LGBTQ RAND for this, this moment, this important moment in our history. How did I know? Well, Janie, I thought that I was going to be a lawyer. You know, I was one of those kids that was always cradle Presbyterian. I was always in youth group and doing youth leadership stuff. And in high school uh, in Georgia, I went to a Presbyterian church in Georgia and folks always say to me, you're going to be a pastor one day. And I would always say, no, thank you. Thanks, though. I, I admire you seeing that in me. But no, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a lawyer. And I'm in college studying for my LSATs and I have a Wesleyan moment of a strange warm feeling in my heart and I feel like that was God's moment of saying you're going to go to seminary and I made a, a bet with God it's the first and the last time I've done it um and I said well you know I don't know about that <laughs> but if I get into any school that I apply to I will unequivocally go, but I'm not going to, you know, I was in college. I said, I'm not going to stop, you know, with my parties. I wasn't wild, but I was a college student. I'm not going to stop being who I am, but I'll go. And so I got into, I got into every school I applied for. And then I kept my end of the bargain and I went. And then from there, the world just opened up to me. Um, and it felt like a place that I belonged, but I, I didn't know if I could see myself in the church and the pressures of the church. Um, and I wound up coming out in seminary first semester uh, freshman year so it, it was a very meaningful moment for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so moving along as we did and hearing what happened to you then look what's happened in our movement mm -hmm. so much first of all we got the internet <laughs> And the, you know, that was a huge thing. Remember, I was before the internet. So it was this whole thing of LGBT people being able to have access in some way, yeah. but yet still the tremendous violence against us and naming us as the church named us as self-avowed, unrepentant practicing. 
and you remember all the hilarious things we would say, like we're not practicing, we're really real, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing. But we went through all of that and the violence and so many people in the closet. And as we began to emerge, as we began to emerge, it was like, when we no longer came confessing to the church and said, here we are, we're right beside you, we're right with you, we're in the church. When we didn't confess anymore and we just said, here we are, something happened to us. And no longer were we saying, oh yes, poor us. We were saying, here we are, now use us and meet us. And that's when the church began to change, is when we came forward and said, no more. And our families, PFLY came, our families came, all of the folks came and said, you cannot talk about my children that way anymore. You can't talk about my children. And that was around our LG and then moving into the B. The B was always kind of difficult for people. Well, I don't understand. So then we had bisexual people come forward and say, this is who, this is who we are and so on. And then our transgender, transgender siblings. I mean, this is where we are now. This is where we see the violence now. This is where we see the rules against. This is where we see the laws. Because when you take on patriarchy, and this is what we're taking on, that whole male female thing, here comes all these young people who say, guess what? Gender is fluid. Guess what? We are gender queer. You know, this is what's happening now. We are transgender and we are proud and we love who we are. And this is when the shift is happening. And this is when the rules, people are frightened. What is this thing? What do you mean by transgender? And so on. So, Ananda, you know this very well from your experience. And then we can talk about Trans Heartline, but take it from there as because you know this well. Do you know? Well, thank you, Jane. Well, I, I had a partner who transitioned way back in the day. Um, and being a partner of somebody transitioning, somebody being on T, you know, going through top surgery, who was also seeking ordination in the Methodist church at the time. I realized there were very few, there's now a lot of resources by comparison for trans people and for um, their partners and systems of support, their chosen and biological family, you know, and around 2014, you know, there wasn't really anything that was stone butch blues, you know, that book, and then maybe one or two YouTube channels of trans folk who are brave enough to capture their stories and share. So I would go online and in trying to support my partner and search and search and search um, for information that I needed to know about um, what happens when folks are on T. Um, hear feedback from my partner, what support they need, um, both spiritually and emotionally, as they're just, you know, going about their day and walking around and having people question their gender and, and receive, you know, very hostile feedback, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that became a wake up call as to the constant expansion of queerness. Um, that to me, queerness is a process theology embodied, meaning that it is always already like becoming and growing and expanding, just as God is always already becoming, growing and expanding. And so how do I get on board with that process as a cisgendered identified ally? And it made me uh, examine my own understanding of gender and which ways am I queer and which ways do I bend gender to express the full the fullness of myself and even which ways do you know my hetero family members do they bend gender but there's not necessarily language for it in the hetero community because of patriarchy right um but that that we actually all live queer lives in one way shape or another because the construct of what is feminine and what is masculine um is very narrow and and differs from culture to culture and so that was my introduction into my need to become more aware and as an, an lgbtq identified person to support other lgbtq identified people and realize that no there are folks more marginalized than me i'm a black queer cis woman but there are folks more marginalized than me. So how do I give them a platform instead of taking from them in our movement, right? And how do I learn from them? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my broad overview. How about you, Janie? Well, I think too, just like you, um, I think for me to just hear the same kind of things like housing, 
education, all the kinds of things. It's like all these things and race plays such, racism plays such a huge part in that. So we found out in doing more of our work um, as queer people and to really hearing our transgender assemblies was to hearing all that they're going through, hearing that the violence is mostly now against African-American women, transgender women, Many are murdered and so on. So we did a lot of work around that. We're doing, we're really owning our own privilege and our own racism so that we can do the work that needs to be done. And so one of the things that Ananda and I got involved with was um, this work called Trans Heartline in which a wonderful um, transgender man told us what he wanted to do that what he wanted to do was to had a dream of a house in which people could be safe to come after their affirmation surgery because he had not had that. His name is Jordan Decker and he had not had that kind of care. Um, so what we did is just, you know, what you do with queer ministry, you just say, okay, let's do this, you know? And what happens is all of a sudden it was like everything began to came together and we, we, we brought together uh, pastors, we brought together the LGBT center, we brought together social workers and nurses and so on. We said, okay, now what we wanna do here is we wanna create in Marin County of all places, which is very expensive, we said, what we wanna do. So we went to the seminary. It was then the seminary, San Francisco Theological Seminary, where, where you were chaplain and, and we went there and we said, guess what you get to do? Since we know that you are LGBT, supportive. We've got a wonderful thing for you to do. We've got transgender people and this is what we want to do. We want to create a house in which people can come and they can be affirmed after their surgery. Well, guess what? They said yes. yes. Lots of the folks were really, really great. They said yes. So we have begun to have, this is now three years, Ananda, and we have three years of being with people who are going through transition and learning what it means to be who they are, but they come to a place in which rather than being told no or terrible or bad, they're coming to say, welcome. And who gives them food every week are eight religious, uh, eight churches or, or faith communities, really eight faith communities, all different kinds, and then an LGBT senior group. And what happens is, they all bring food once a week and they come in and they say hello. So what is happening in this house is that so many of our transgender people, like many of us were before, have been rejected by their faith communities, have been thrown out of their faith communities. And here they come and here are faith communities that are bringing food and love into the place. And we're really trying to be very careful so that uh, we have right up on the wall, right? And then on the wall, it says, who are you and what are your pronouns? Yes. And so that people are not misnamed or hurt or with, by their dead name. And so this is what's happening to us right in Marin County. What we hope to do, you know, to invite these seminaries are like, whoa, what is this? We hope to say, how would other seminaries like to do this and provide an amazing house? And it's a beautiful house. And what we did, we went out and we bought all new furniture. And so because we said, this is a place that is a grand place, is a beautiful place, is a welcome place. And uh, the stories there, there's so many stories, but you, you take it from there, Ananda, because you were with me right from the beginning. It was like, whoa, here we go, right? It's so true. It's a, it's a very special place. And it to me, it's congruent with your history of ministry, of acknowledging queer agency, and that that is a divine birthright. All of our agency is a divine birthright. Um, and culture, uh, creating a culture of community, of accountability, and really building relationship. And if there's one thing I've learned from you over the years, Janie, it is relationship building is the key to authentic relationship and getting to know and understand and learn about somebody else as well as yourself. And so in that frame, do you feel the needs of the LGBTQ community are the same as they were? Uh, and you, you determine where the were, <laughs> how far back the were is. Well, 
Like I said, right from the beginning, it was such um, a terrible struggle. I mean, I remember uh, traveling around the country and I went into one place in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, we were speaking at a local seminary there and I had two people come up beside me and say, are you Reverend Spar? And I said, yes. And they said, well, we want you to turn around because there's a bomb threat here. Um, so that's how much it was. And MCC, as we know, had several of their churches bombed. I mean, we were our lives were threatened many times. Um, and I think too, just the fear that people have uh, about what might be different. Uh, that's, that's what I saw. So when people would say terrible things to me and to us, uh, it was like, keep loving them back. You know, don't take this in. They don't understand. And I remember as time went on for several of us that were out there in the beginning, after a while, I got to the point of saying this. I hear that you love me and I thank you so much. You know, I go and speak all around the country. I hear that you love me, but do you know what? It's not enough that you love me. You have to vote for me. You have to vote for us. You have to say that you are accountable. Don't tell me. I can't tell you how many people behind closed doors would say, we are with you. We are with you. Well, then I say, well, then step forward and say that. And these are our allies. These are our family members. You know, these, these are the folks that come forward and so on like that. So as we, as I saw that movement and then we came more and more forward, our families came more and more forward and so on this, we owe this now greatly to our transgender friends and siblings to be there, to be there in a huge way because so much of it, for a long time, we were wounded inside or believed the terrible stuff that people said about us. So we changed that. And so the thing is, it's really, to, as you said, Amanda, to be accountable, to help make the way, the path smoother for those who are risking everything by being who they are. And I think, especially in this country, when we see these huge domination systems, and it's really, you know, political parties, I'm thinking of these domination systems that are so horrific. And it's really to stand with, to stand with and to listen and let their stories be told. Don't get in the way. It's time for transgender people to, to be told, to tell their stories. And our work is as allies is to be underneath, is to cheering, is to creating resources, is to helping that happen. Our way is not to get in the way or then we become patronizing and become a part of the domination system. It's their story to tell. And that's, as I think of, the resources that we received, that we received and so on, it's it's helping, it's leveling the playing field, as they say, it's making everybody equal. And what I'm learning then with all of this is the galaxies of gender mm. and how we have slotted people into this is male and this is female and how damaging that has really been for many of our folks. So what's happened to me then and Andy, as I have been looking at my gender fluidity and looking at my pronouns and so on like that, it's like, holy moly, this can happen to me, you know, where I go from she, they, them, you know, all these kinds of things, because I understand that we are all actually transgender in many ways, how we go across. So um, you take it from there. How are your pronouns and how, how are you holding up? Oh, thank you, Janie. My pronouns are she and her. On occasion, I find that she and her isn't quite enough and I can blend into a they day or <laughs> days, yes. you know? Um, yeah. I think at the moment I've been on a femme kick, but I mean, you've seen me throughout the years. I've been a dandy where I've just been incredibly <laughs> masculine wearing ties and suits and Oxford shoes. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think now what I'm really exploring in terms of, uh, gender is is the fluidity of the relationship of myself and how that ties into my spiritual practice mm -hmm. so as a christian I'm, I'm really focusing on you know the second commandment of love your neighbor as you love yourself and so i've been on exploration of self-love 
love and what does that mean within the context of my gender? What does that mean in the context of my sexuality? You know, as my former partner transitioned, it also impacted my sexuality because I realized, oh, I'm no longer lesbian, I'm queer. Yeah. Um, and I like being queer. Like I can, I now know and have been expanded that I can love a multiplicity of gender identities, right? And yes. be attracted to a multiplicity of I gender identities, attraction, sex, the church is so afraid of it, but it's natural, right? So, and I think then the freedom, what we do as we become freer and freer and as our all our friends become freer and freer, then we let God be freer and freer. Correct. I mean, and the words, whether it's goddess or God, spirit, whatever the word is, I just have fallen in love with something so expansive. And whether we, whatever the name is, do you know, it's, it's this expansive fluidity of love that undergirds everything for me. So it's, I've, I've freed God, thank you, or God has freed herself or their self, whatever, which has given me such, um, well, like expansiveness, so that when I'm with people and wherever they may be on their journey, it's like I can be so present with them because I just feel this, as you talked about, that warm place in your heart. It's this place that just opens up, opens up, and opens up. So all that is happening so that these domination systems, which we are trying to collapse into the gospel or into whatever people may think, is collapse them into equality, that this becomes easier. And you're, we're getting more um, inklings, I think, from something so much more than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I see right now because I'm older now and I'm, I'm burying a lot of my friends. Um, I see with them as they are crossing over, I see something so much more about what friends of mine taught me around HIV as they were dying and so on. It's like being with them all the way through and sending them forth in a different way than I ever knew. Is that making any sense to you? That does make sense. Can I ask a question to, to push a little further? Yeah. So Janie, a lot of people talk about the awesome and amazing things that you do and the ministries that you've had, but very rarely have I heard the question of like, what has been your spiritual practice? How do you connect with God? If you feel comfortable sharing, sharing that. And I want to take advantage of this moment to ask what has been your spiritual practice that that you've taken on that allows you that has fed you to do the work and the call in the ministry that you do well thank you for that i want to ask you that too um i think you know nanda i'm a twin and so twins are very connected across so many lines it's like i knew with joni I knew with my twin, I knew everything she was thinking. It's hard to explain to someone who is an identical twin. So the thing is, I feel like, I feel like I kind of have this relationship, whoever this spirit is. I feel a deep, deep abiding connection from deep inside. So that every trial or anything I've ever been on, it's almost like, I don't know how to say it. We give each other a wink. It's like, yeah, this is it. We get to say, we get to say who we are. You know, I mean, all these trials, they gave us a chance to say, well, this is who we are. And this is who God is to us and all this kind of thing. Every time it got really struggle, it was like, it was almost like, okay, here we go. And I can't, it's, it's this connection that is so deep. You know what? So I feel it all the time. I feel it. Uh, I feel it when I'm with people. I'm so crazy about people, you know. And so I just feel this thing inside that is so uh, beautiful and, and so overwhelming. And, and I'm just able to ride with it. Um, and it's almost like 
what I had with my twin, that's the only way I know how to say it, is that you're connected in such a deep place. So what is my spiritual practice? My spiritual practice is to live. My spiritual practice is to relate. My spiritual practice is to be, you know, and now it's not only to be with people, but my spiritual practice is to be with the earth because the earth is crying so much. We are so violent against the earth. So all this stuff, when they're talking about climate change and stuff like that, I mean, the weeping, I, I hear weeping. I think spirit is weeping. And so how can I, how can I love spirit more in the weeping so that we, we change these things? So the practices, that's, it's every day. It's everybody I'm with. It's like, it's how I breathe. I breathe and I'm allowing myself uh, more, more and more to just be in it. Just, just say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always, thank you. Thank you. Let use me, let me you know, is that making, so tell me yours. Tell me your spiritual practice. Uh, my spiritual practice has has really been digging into those first and second commandments. You know, um, most recently, I've really come to the conclusion as a proving elder that I reach out to most Fridays. She told me a few months ago, she's like, Ananda, Jesus is indigenous. <laughs> and I sat with it for a few weeks and here I am thinking, you know, using, you know, progressive lens, historical critical method. Yeah, Jesus was a Palestinian Jew and occupied Rome. And I realized a few weeks ago, no, that's not what she meant. She meant Jesus's relationship, the way that Jesus was, his being was an indigenous way. It was in right relationship with himself, with spirit, with all of creation, this understanding of reciprocity, of balance of being. And so that has become my practice is not in a way that is um, not in a way that, uh, you know, takes advantage of or misconstrues what, that which we consider to be indigenous, because we're all indigenous. We all come from indigenous peoples as humans, right? right. I have, my spiritual practice has been living into what does it mean to be in relationship with the earth? And acknowledging there's some limits, a lot of limits, actually, for me in historical Christianity and how I've been trained to even connect with the earth, to even have language for the earth. And so, and that to me is a part of that love and that self-love because we're earth aliens. We are dirt people, Adama, Adama, right? Yes. Uh, and so that's been my practice is being. And what does it mean to be in relationship, authentic relationship? What is, what's my capacity for our authentic relationship at any particular moment? And how do I nurture that? How do I not perform, but be authentic? And how do I find out who I am? in that authenticity, in that relationship. So I've started keeping bees, like that's a spiritual practice. I've started meditating, but well, I've been meditating, but even more so to slow down my mind, you know, I've been digging my hands in the earth um, to be in broader relationship with myself and to be accountable, you know, I'm accountable to the planet. It feeds me. It is, it has fed my ancestors for generations, all of us. Mm -hmm. And it has the capacity to, to continue to do so. Um, if we but treat it, you know, like it is our mother. <laughs> yes. So I think of that. Oh, Ananda, thank you so much for that. I, I think um, especially I love, you know, indigenous, that Jesus was indigenous. And I think I've learned so much. And now the Presbyterian Church, you know, is doing finally it's racism work around how we treat people. But the doctrine of discovery and how we have treated indigenous people and what has happened at the boarding schools, all of those things. And then visiting family who are indigenous and what that has meant for me. I think for me, it is, has been, again, that terrible individualism that has um, just about killed us. I, I think I think it's white privilege, all of that. And I think it's also um, because what I see so much, and as people identify in indigenous communities, it's all about community. It's not about individuals. It's about community. And, and everything is about community. Everything you do, everything you are. So you would never, you know, even to name yourself, well, hi, I'm a lesbian. Well, yeah, I'm a white lesbian. And I can say that. You know what I'm saying? But it's 
it's the fullness of who we are. So I should be saying what? That I'm European American, that I'm, you know, all those things that I am, which indigenous people always talk about who they, who they are in community. And I think, you know, several of my friends who were African American, the same thing, they said this individualism, Janie, has killed us in our community. I mean, when I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my first my very first pastorate with Wanda Graham Harris. It was so incredible to be in the African American community and go into. But it was always about community. It was not about, hey, you know, it's me and what I'm going to do and I whatever. It's that domination system that we have to break down. That's what. That's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking about. So, any more thoughts? Any more thoughts from you, my friend? Can you please tell the people what your work is about? Because we've talked about training, but please tell them what you're doing because I'm so thrilled about this. Would you please share? Sure. Thanks, Jane. So I am uh, currently this year at Stanford, um, blessed to be able to research uh, spiritual, emotional, and existential distress and moral injury. Um, and in particular STEM students. So a pastoral concern that I've had uh, has been the technology shift that we're in. It's the biggest technological shift in the history of humanity is happening right now. Uh, and so knowing that the tech community is largely male, mostly white men, Asian men, um, and they're building products that impact at a scale of magnitude not yet before seen, and we're still not fully able to comprehend in our brains that, that impact um, the spiritual and emotional distress that they're going through. Uh, it has high suicide rate, it has high rates of anxiety and depression, and so uh, I'm currently looking at the pipeline between education and the tech community, and how do we interrupt both, and so right now I'm, I'm doing the education part, and it's my hope that we can that I can begin to teach emotional resilience, spiritual uh, depth and understanding, meaning and meaning making and purpose in STEM students. So that way they are able to recognize their emotions, recognize their connection, recognize um, what they're doing and the impact of people who may not look like them, right? Who will come from different cultures from them um, and uh, how that can positively change the world. You know, a great example I'll give really briefly is, you know, our friend Floyd <laughs> Duncan shared this example with me, but um, there was a black couple uh, a few years ago who tried to purchase a house in Maine. Well, most of the mortgage software now is FinTech, financial technology, right? And so um, the person who designed this particular financial software just used the historical average of houses being bought in Maine as their data points. Well, if you know anything about redlining in the United States, you know, like ghettos were actual creation, right? Like the ghetto didn't just pop up out of nowhere. Like black people, even till to this day, still struggle to qualify for mortgages and houses, even though for those who are financially qualified, right? So that's still happening. Um, and so because the person who designed the FinTech did not have the um, historical data, did not really have a humanities course to understand that what they're creating in science has social implications and cultural implications. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know, they didn't think that, oh, if I use this aggregate data, or historical data over several years, that this will automatically uh, discount in particular black people and general people of color from ever qualifying for a, for a home mortgage, right? And so my goal, uh, my ministry, um, and I think I'm going to dedicate my life to this. I think it, I will be so bold as to say that because the work really is that big. It's going to take that much, um, that much is, is to disrupt that and say, hey, what you're creating has a context, has a history, has a culture, has a people that you're impacting, right? So what is that context? So what is that history? Um, if you knew about redlining before, you know, the, the, the data would have changed, right? Um, and they wouldn't have had to struggle to purchase a home. And so that's in general kind of what, what I'm trying to do is figure out how do we adapt to this new technology that's coming and how do we not perpetuate these systems of dominance, patriarchy, white supremacy, um, you know, settler colonial ways um, yeah. into technology because we're doing it, right? So how do we stop it? 
And how do we create broader space for folks, trans people, more people of color, people who use technology culturally different, right? Like the way technology is mostly used is in a Western, you know, American or European framework, but there are other cultural ways to understand how to use technology. So my, my thing is like, what does an indigenous use of technology look like, right? What does an indigenous culture around technology look like? And how do we give those people platforms and spaces? Wow. So how do you so you have you're doing all of that right and and you have a church that you are working in so how do you do this together how do you balance <laughs> because we know church we know time so how do you balance because what you're talking about here is critical for moving now into our future so yeah. how are you in, infusing this or balancing this with your church? Well, I think I have, I have two spaces of support. I have the Presbyterian Church in San Jose Presbyterian. I also have Auburn Seminary and the Edwards Fellowship, which is supporting this dream work of tech. And so it's, some days are better than others, Janie, but uh, I try to double dip, you know? I don't think my, my study and curiosity about moral, spiritual, and emotional distress and injury is just for STEM students. Um, and, and my quest of moral injury actually came from Rita Nakashima Brock's work, you know, and I read the book Proverbs of Ashes and it was the first time I heard non-substitutionary atonement, the argument that Jesus didn't die for your sins, that this is also, it's, you know, it's an argument that human beings, this is what we do to each other at our worst. We kill each other and that the love and the teachings of Jesus don't die. And that totally <laughs> reframed my understanding of Christianity. I think helps the moral injury or the soul break that she talks about in her work, that there's a soul break that can happen. Um, and that's what I'm trying to repair, right? And so I think that there are, I, I, I double dip. <laughs> I apply what I can that I'm doing over here in, in this work of STEM and tech um, into the church and vice versa. I apply aspects of the church and that ministry into STEM and tech. And I struggle sometimes with the balance, but I've realized opening myself up you know, which as a black woman, you know, a Jamaican American, African American background, I've, I've been taught, I've been trained, you know, don't tell everybody all your business or like who you are as a way to protect myself. What I'm slowly realizing is when I'm in communities of people that actually do care, whether they look like me or not, whether we share the same identities or not, um, that sharing myself and who I am, I find people who are willing to support um, areas that are that are needed in the communities and contexts that we share so um, so sharing you know with the folks that i'm working with here at stanford what i'm going through and sharing with my congregation what i'm going through and finding ways to meet in the middle you know what a balancing what a balancing but it's so critical and you know nanda i saw you teach you know when we went up to zephyr cove and I think what is so needed now, because so much of what I came from in the seminaries was we were we were taught, you know, you you ask questions maybe at the end, but it was like, take this in, read these books. And of course, they were all male theologians and so on. Um, and then finally to break free and to read as you know it was so freeing as my friend kathy black said she went in for her uh doctoral um she said you know what i'm not going to read any more books by men i've read them all thank you so much i'm going to start reading books by women and women of color so thank you and and, and that's how i have to continue my work i think because so much was infused into us from that white male supremacy all of that in there and the you know the bart bart boltman you know all of that and not that they weren't good people i don't mean that but i think it's this freedom that we have now and then to 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 move beyond and to read and to think through all our queer theology and our moving away from white queer, queer theology you know i mean all of this transgender all of these things it's just freeing us more and more but when i saw you teach i saw you teach not only using the, the usual way of teaching but not only the questions and so on but how you used many different media 
many different ways. You use the technology that you're talking about so that people are far more participatory in wherever we, I just saw the participation and some people learn differently and so on. So there was the media part, there was the film part. I mean, all these ways that we are doing it differently now or otherwise we are caught in, like you say, it's either in the technology, it's either the white male or the Asian male, whatever. No, no, no. These are constructs that have to be opened up. And look, and I am grateful to you. And I want to say to you, because I am 79 years old, I have prayed for people like you to carry on, you and my buddy Lisa Largis and so many, to carry on this amazing liberation work that is not just about LGBTQ people, but it's about the people of the world and culturally and so on. So I am honored to be with you this day. I thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. So much and we you. have some questions coming in. So let me say that we're honored to be with both of you today. I have to say, you know, people ask about the LGBTQ alphabet soup. And I have to say, Jay, you did a great job of explaining how these letters got added on and that it's really a history lesson. It's how we're evolving and there are gonna be more. We just don't know what they are. And Anna, you really are the future. I mean, um, I keep thinking about what happened with Facebook yesterday. I mean, you're really working on the ethical issues that Facebook should have had an ethics team involved in how we're going to create society. So really, thank you both. So we actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is for Janie, and actually, Amanda, you can say to it. Can you speak about the use of humor in movements of change. I recall that one of your greatest gifts, Janie, that back in the day was to get people smiling and laughing. Well, I think it's always the people's stories. You know, there's nothing like giving people back their stories. And it is, if you don't have your humor, and I think those of us that are queer, we knew that if we didn't have our humor and laugh hysterically at times, uh, you know, the people always say to me, oh, Janie, you know, it's been such hard work and so on. But I have this wonderful guy who calls me, you know, call, called Amazing Grace and calls me and says things like this. I've got Jesus on my backpack, God by my side, and the Holy Spirit as an astro burn. I mean, stuff like this. You couldn't even write this. And we get these hysterical moments where you just, it, it's, it's how it, it's what carries us through. I think our humor is what, and and being with people in the audience and so on like that is to is to make them comfortable. Is to, because sexuality and spirituality people don't see how they go together. So you're loving them and helping them, but through humor is is the very is the way to do it. I think I've I have found yes. And do you use humor? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Listen definitely. to her laugh, you'll know. <laughs> All right, so the other question is from somebody you knew ages ago, probably still know today. Uh, the question is that you, Jenny, you helped create a task force to increase the number of women attending MCC in San Francisco just as the AIDS crisis was starting. And also that you created, had a workshop on exploring new images of God. Could you speak briefly to those two events in your life? Yes, that's that wonderful Lynn Jordan. You right. know, MCC, when the Presbyterians were like, what do we do with her? Goddess loves MCC. They, they just opened their hearts to me. And it was so, it was so, thank you. Thank you. It, it was just so, I became their director of pastoral care and actually, you know, Presbyterians do do things wonderfully, decently, and in order. And we set up this wonderful pastoral care experience that we did together. And we had lots of, uh, we, it, we called it the neighborhood program. And so we had people from all the neighborhoods. Uh, we had these leaders from all the neighborhoods who got together. And, and it was a huge community in the Castro then. Oh, my heavens, huge community. And so we worked together. And so when HIV hit and so on, we had put in place 
this we had three therapists that worked with us it, it was an amazing program and i um it was just as hiv was hitting and we we had a um, chaplain we worked with uh, the shanti project it was quite phenomenal wasn't it lynn uh that what we did there as hiv hit i can't even begin to tell you uh what it was like for our people who were dying so quickly and and we didn't know we didn't know was was it the water was it a you know, all that kind of thing so we put this program in place and um it was life-changing for me as well and i think it was life-giving to the people who would come in they were like my son's age and so on and they had bruises all over them which we knew was Kaposi sarcoma and um uh, all of that was happening all at once, and they would pour into the church there. So um, that was a time I, I will, well, you know. The other was, you know, if you're going to, if you say to people, how can we get women in the church? Well, then you put a woman on staff, <laughs> you know, and then you put a woman on staff. And guess what? They came. Guess what? They came. And that's the thing. If you want people, then you give them people that they can identify with. So, you know, I was so happy to be be on staff with them. There were five men and me and the rascals, I will, the rascals. But we, we said, okay. And they, some of these men, like Michael Eng England was a great feminist and so on. So we started this group about what are the different images of God? And we, you know, Virginia Mollicott wrote a great piece on this and so on from Baker Woman to all kinds of images and so on. So we did this and this brought more women in, but men too. I mean, uh, it was, it, the, that church there in San Francisco was really, a lot of its leadership was feminist and the stories, it was the humor, you know, just before I'd be going out to preach, they'd go, oh my God, look at her. Come on, fix her hair, get, get her some pearls. Let's get her out there. And so, I mean, before you walked on, you were hysterically laughing. So, I mean, it was, uh, that church, that church, helped me fall in love with what it means to be lesbian and Christian. And look how all of that has just expanded, expanded. But that church helped me just fall in love with my, with what it means to be. Right. So did I answer that? I'm not sure I was. I hope I did, Lynn. And Nancy, do you want to answer to that? Oh, no. Linda can no join us in the uh, informal comments afterwards or informal sessions. So again, I really want to thank you both. Um, we've got a few more closing remarks, but I'm going to uh, have Rick join us for a few minutes. Rick, can you unmute yourself and come on? I'm unmuted and I'm on. I've got to say, this has just been fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, and, you know, my, my brain is just swirling. So my, my, my responsibility at the moment is to remind us all that we have a, an audacious $20,000 goal to help fund LGBTQ RAND so that we can continue on into the future. We're halfway there and um, we've made it as easy as possible. And don't forget, there is uh, a, a generous do, uh, benefactor who is going to double whatever we contribute. And for first time donors, it'll be doubled again. So mm -hmm. it'll be triple, triple your, uh, your generosity. So thanks so much. And again, you know, especially uh, Jamie and Ananda, you, you are just wonderful. And I wish I were with you in person. Mm -hmm. Thank Someday. you. <laughs> Hey, so you've gotten a taste of what these conversations are going to be like. As I said, I want to remind you, you can stay on afterwards to talk more informally, but I want to remind you now of the people who are going to be coming up for the next conversations. Um, they've got a high bar to meet because you've done a fabulous job, but thank you. So on October 13th, we'll have a theologian, scholar, and a free thinker who identifies as a Black trans man. Reverend Jonathan Thunderbird, and the founder of the Activist Theology Project, Robin Henderson Espinoza, PhD. On October 20th, 
we have a preeminent Jewish lesbian feminist thinker and writer, Evie Tarkin Beck, a PhD and assistant professor and author, Zohar Wyman Kelman, PhD. On October 27th, we will have the administrator and senior bishop of the Unity Fellowship Church Movement, Bishop Zachary Jones, along with third year PhD student, the Reverend Paul Anthony Dan Daniels, and will be able to posthumously honor the former prelate of the Unity Fellowship Church Movement, Archbishop Carol Bean. Mm -hmm. To complete our series, we have the founder of the Metropolitan Community Churches, the Reverend Elder Dr. Troy Perry, and psychotherapist and author, Matthias Roberts. So be sure to RSVP for one or all of the conversations so you have the link to come back. And remember, they're all at the same time on Wednesday, so block out your calendar. You won't be disappointed, especially if you've seen this one. And finally, we wanna celebrate we might we have a closing celebration on, on Sunday, the November 7th, and I'm hoping that all of you can join us for that um, and to close out the month-long celebration that we have. Again, I can't thank enough Amanda and Jane for being here today and for all the participants for coming. Um, Jane and Ananda, you have to read what came through in the chat because you're much loved and there were great comments. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and thanks to Asati and Irene very much for making this all technologically possible and for all that they are doing for LGBTQ RAN. And of course, Mark, and, and thanks to you, Marnie and the board and Rick, we're just, we're just very, very grateful. And thanks to you, Ananda. By heaven, it's nice to be on here with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.